Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level, Biology Unit 5 for June 2022. And this is the part one video. I will do this paper in two parts and put the link to part two video in the description box below here. So let's begin. Question one says the brain is made up of more than one times 10 power 11 neurons. So they say the diagram shows a section through the human brain. And then they ask, label the diagram to show the location of the following. They want us to show the location of the pituitary gland, which is that here, the location of the medulla oblongata, which is this part here, and then the location of the cerebral hemisphere, which is that part there. So you can see I labeled the three parts that were required. Then part B says, complete the table to show the parts of the brain and their functions. So when they say the cerebellum, it is in charge of uh, coordinating voluntary movements. The medulla oblongata, of course, controls heart rate, ventilation rate. And then the cerebral hemispheres, these are the site for intelligence, memory, reasoning, emotions, control, and uh, critical thinking. So basically any of these, if you had written them, you would get this mark correct. This brings us to the end of question one. Let's move on to question two. Question two says the kidney is an organ that is involved in the removal of waste metabolized from the blood. The drawing shows the blood supply inside a Bowman's capsule, which is the renal capsule. So here they ask, uh, down here they, says, they say complete the diagram to show the Bowman's capsule and level two structures in this diagram. So I began by looking at the efferent arterial, which was already labeled for us. And then I went here to say if the labeled arterial, the afferent one, I can label the efferent arterial as well. So that is one way. I also label the glomerulus. You can see this is the ball of blood capillaries inside here. So that is one. So remember they said complete the diagram to show the Bowman's cup. So I had to put this part here. And when I put it, I label the best membrane. So any two of these, you'll get the marks they're looking for. So that will be okay to get that. And then the next part says, which substances are normally filtered from blood in the Bowman's capsule? So here they ask, A is amylose and glucose. Of course, we do not have amylose in our bodies. That is out. Then uh, they say potassium ions and hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a big protein. It cannot go through. It cannot be filtered. And then urea and prothrombin. Prothrombin is also protein, though it's soluble, but it cannot go through. So this is wrong. The only thing is glucose and sodium chloride. So the answer should be a B. So next they ask, which row shows the root taken by a water molecule through the nephron uh, in the kidney? Of course, it has to go through the proximal tubule first, so that and that is okay. And then it goes to the loop of Hanley, so this is out. It goes to the distal tubule. You remember this is the first coil tubule and this is the second coil tubule. And then finally through the collecting duct. So D shows the right pathway. So here they're going to ask, describe how glucose reabsorption takes place in the nephron. Remember they're asking how it takes place. Remember it, uh, it cannot be reabsorbed using uh, active transport, using energy from ATP. So we have to include all that. So I said glucose reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, or you can say first coil tubule. It is reabsorbed using co-transport with sodium ions. That is correct. And then active transport takes place to ensure 100% reabsorption using energy from ATP. And then glucose diffuses into the blood capillaries down the concentration gradient. This is if diffusion occurs, it is gonna be down the concentration gradient. That is if passive transport and it can be against concentration gradient for active transport. So, and again, this was a three mark question. Any three of these would be okay. I included this part to show you that uh, sometimes it can be passive transport, just diffusion, and other times it can be active transport uh, against the concentration gradient. Lastly, here they ask, urea is produced by the metabolic breakdown of some organic molecules. Which statement describes the production of urea? Now we know urea is made in the liver not in the kidneys, so this is already out. Urea is made in the liver and it's not made from glycogen, it's made using excess amino acids. Remember your body cannot store the amino acids that cannot be used, so the excess are gonna be broken down uh, to form urea, and then the other product can be stored, used for respiration. So this is gonna be the C, which is the answer to this question. This brings us to the end of question two. Let's move on to question three. Question three. 
Chemicals are used to regulate responses in both plants and animals. In mammals, antidiuretic hormone ADH is involved in regulating plasma concentration and blood volume. Which of the following produces ADH? What we know is ADH, naturally, it's going to be produced in the hypothalamus. However, after it is going to be released into the pituitary glands, and then so the pituitary gland will be the one to release it in the end. However, it was produced in the hypothalamus, so here the answer should be a B. Then the next part says which structure does ADH act on? ADH acts on the kidneys, however, it acts on the collecting that. So not capillaries, not the proximal tubule, and not ureters, only here. Uh, for, from the available answers, it will only act on the collecting that. Part 3 says, the control of plasma concentration and blood volume in the body is an example of which type of process. Of course, plasma concentration, uh, volume of the body, osmoregulation, therefore it has to be negative feedback. So here I say negative feedback. It cannot be habituation, it cannot be countercurrent multiplier, and it cannot be positive feedback. Remember, positive feedback intensifies the change that has happened. An example can be during childbirth when uh, there is uh, contractions. Contractions are going to be intensified, and that is an example of uh, positive feedback. So part four says, name the type of receptor in the body that detects change in the plasma concentration. These are osmoreceptors. So that is what we have here. Let's move on to the next part. This part says the effect of gibberellin on the growth of cereal plants was investigated. Different concentrations of the gibberellin were sprayed on cereal plants. The length of the first, second, and third internode they call it one, two, three. These are all internodes were measured as shown in the diagram. So we can see internode one, internode two, and internode three were shown after exposure to this, uh, this chemical. So they say the table shows the effect of gibberellin on the mean lengths of the first, second, and third internode. We can see if there is zero concentration, we see the first internode is that, second internode is that, and the third internode is that, internode is that. When they increase the concentration to 10, we can see almost there is no change. Everything is exactly the same, so there was no effect. However, when we multiply that by 10, we can see there is a slight increase in the first internode, in the second internode, but nothing in the third internode. Multiplying it by an extra 10, we can see it slightly it increases a little bit, and then this increases by a very small bit, and that a small bit. And then further by 2.5, we get a 56, 22, and so on. So let's see which questions they're asking here. They say, comment on the effect of the gibberellin on the growth of cereal plants. When I looked at this, I saw that overall, if we can see the data overall, there is an increase for each. Uh, we can see there is an increase at least from um, about this. Uh, from 1,000, we can see there is an increase for all because this was a 15, originally it was a 14, this was a 22, and this was a 52. So from this concentration, we can see there is an overall increase for all. So I say, Overall, increasing the concentration of the gibberellin increases the length of the internode. The higher the concentration, we would expect to have the higher uh, the change in length. However, the increase mostly occurred in the first internode. And again, to take you back to the data, you can see the first internode is one that is going to have at, uh, an increase even at 100. We can see it's 41 from 36. This is a very tiny increase. This is exactly the same. The third internode is really hard to increase the length of, uh, to, it's really hard to increase its length uh, due to the change in the concentration of this chemical. So lastly, here they say suggest how the gibberellin causes this effect. How does this uh, plant chemical cause this effect? So I said the gibberellin binds onto the receptors on the surface of the cells. Now, it could be that this binds onto the surface of the, the receptors on the surface of the cell, or it could be that it enters the nucleus. So after binding, uh, for example, if it enters the nucleus, it will act as a transcription factor. That is, if they enter the nucleus, or if it just is binding on the receptor, it will activate transcription factors inside the cell, and then transcription factors will stimulate the synthesis of amylase, and again, to remind you, if it enters the cell, it's going to act as a transcription factor. If it binds on the surface of the receptor, on the receptor on the surface of the cell, it will cause transcription factors to be activated. Now, in all cases, we are going to have transcription factors. The transcription factors will stimulate the synthesis of amylase. Remember, amylase is the enzyme that is going to break down starch. 
providing glucose, which is used for respiration and therefore providing energy required for growth and elongation. So I say the transcription factors stimulate the synthesis of amylase enzyme, which breaks down starch into glucose for respiration, providing energy required for cell division and cell elongation. Remember, we are looking at how this leads to elongation. Elongation will occur because there is energy to cause more cells to, to increase in size or to increase in size or for the chemical reactions within the cells to go on properly. So this will lead to longer internodes. This brings us to the end of question three. I will continue to question four. Question four, Parkinson's disease is caused by a loss of neurons in part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Cobenel doper is used to treat Parkinson's disease. Cobenel doper is a mixture of L doper and a drug that prevents the conversion of L doper into dopamine in blood. Again, remember, if L doper is converted into dopamine in the blood, yet we know that dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier, that means it was useless for us to take L doper. So we have to make sure that L doper does not produce dopamine while it's still in blood. Ensure that 100% of the L doper that is taken up by a patient goes straight to the brain so that it is converted into dopamine once it's already in the brain so that we can prevent a decrease in the concentration of dopamine since our intention is to cause a higher concentration of dopamine in the brain. So here they say explain why using Coben L doper will be more effective than using L doper alone to treat Parkinson's disease. So I said Using Coben L doper ensures that L doper is not converted into dopamine while still in the blood, since dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier. That is important. This can lead to more L doper reaching the brain intact and therefore lead to a higher concentration of dopamine in the brain. Remember, a higher concentration is going to help us so that there is an increase in brain, uh, so that if there is an increase in brain concentration of dopamine, that means there are going to be more impulses or electrical impulses that are going through the postsynaptic neurons, uh, reaching the motor neurons, and that will decrease the muscle tremor effect that is seen among people who have uh, Parkinson's disease. Remember, people with Parkinson's disease have these muscle tremors. Muscle tremors are due to failure of electrical impulses to reach some of the motor neurons. So if increase the, you increase the concentration of dopamine, these muscle tremors will be decreasing uh, a lot because the nerve impulses will be reaching the intended motor neurons, and therefore the patient's life will be kind of improved because they'll be able to live a little bit better lifestyle. Uh, on their on their own because they can be able to handle things and not be shaky all the time. So next it says, in an investigation, tomato plants were genetically modified to convert the amino acid tyrosine into L-doper. Three genes were used in this investigation. A contragene that is not involved in the production of L-doper, MYB12, a plant gene that produces a transcription factor, and then CYP76, a gene, Born in vitro that calls for an enzyme that converts tyrosine into L-dopa. If we can convert tyrosine into L-dopa, yet L-dopa leads to production of dopamine, then that means we are going to have a higher concentration of dopamine. And another thing we know is there is a transcription factor. Remember, transcription factors cause transcription to occur. Maybe this transcription factor is causing the transcription of this gene to occur a little bit faster so that we can produce more, uh, we can produce a higher concentration of this enzyme so that tyrosine is converted into L-dopa in higher concentration and therefore we will have more dopamine. So let me go on. They say, the table shows the concentration of L-dopa in the tomato fruit from genetically modified plants. So here when we look, they say genes used to modify the tomato plants. Here there is no gene. We see the concentration is 1.2. This is concentration of l dopa in tomato fruit per 100 grams. So when they put the contragene, it's exactly the same, meaning the contragene had no effect. And if they put MYB12, remember MYB12 is a transcription factor. Using the transcription factor caused a little bit increase in concentration by about 0.3. And then when they used the gene, remember this gene leads to production of the enzyme, which can convert tyrosine into L-dopa, we can see there is a very high change in the concentration. So uh, you can see from initial to that, it's about an increase of 9 milligrams per 100 grams of uh, the tomato fruit. 
So we can see, and then when you use a combination of both, we can see there is further an increase. So here they said, explain the effect of these three genes in the investigation. So the effect, of course, I say the control gene had no effect on the synthesis of l -dopa. Here we can see that the concentration still remained 1.2 milligram per 100 grams, so there was no change. It therefore had no effect. Then the MYB12 has very little effect on the synthesis of l -dopa. We saw it was 0 0.3 milligrams per 1,000 grams. That is the change, so it had little effect. Even if it's a transcription factor, it had little effect because it will only cause the available genes to be the one to be transcribed further, and that could be a little bit less. Then when we use TYP76 gene, this is the gene that leads to the formation of the enzyme, uh, this caused a great increase of 9 milligrams per 100 grams of L-dopa. Remember, this enzyme causes the conversion of tyrosine into L-dopa. So this is because it codes for the enzyme that leads to the synthesis of L-dopa from tyrosine. So meaning, using if this gene is present, it's going to be transcribed, and then the enzyme is going to be produced, which is a protein, and then that protein or that enzyme is going to cause tyrosine found in this tomato to be converted into L-dopa. Then lastly here I said using both, this is for the final experiment, you can see this one. When we use both MYB12 and then CYP76, remember one is a transcription factor and the other is a gene that leads to the formation of the enzyme required to convert tyrosine into L-dopa. This caused the greatest increase in the concentration of L-dopa and this is because the MYB12 is a transcription factor that led to, the, uh, the more, to more synthesis of the CYP76 protein leading to more conversion of tyrosine to L-dopa. And again, remember this protein is the enzyme I'm talking about. Okay, so moving on to the next part, they say, describe how tomato plants could be genetically modified to make the enzyme that convert tyrosine to L-dopa. So if we are making this enzyme, it means we need to identify the genes that are going to be responsible for this. We will extract and isolate this gene. For example, this is a CYP76 that convert tyrosine into L-dopa, and then using the same restriction enzyme to cut the, the gene out of uh, its mother DNA or its mother chromosome, and then we can cut out, uh, also use the, cut the plasmid using the same restriction enzyme, and then afterwards we can insert that gene into our plasmid to create a vector. Then using suitable methods like heat shock, we can introduce the vector into uh, our tomato and that means the genes have been introduced, and therefore protein synthesis can occur, producing the protein, which is basically the enzyme that can be used to convert tyrosine into L-dopa. This brings us to the end of this video, which is uh, until question four. So I hope uh, you, you had a good time. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.